Hey Rob. Hey it's Raz. Um, can you please introduce yourself for those who might not know you? Sure. Uh, so I'm Rob Wormald and I'm a developer advocate on the Angular team. Uh, I've been at Google about a year. Uh, before that I contracted for about a year on the Angular team and before that I was just uh, an Angular developer out in the world doing enterprise apps. Angular I think is is doing really great, right? What do you think is the most surprising thing about the, the adoption that you've seen with Angular? You know, we had a great community with AngularJS. We had a huge amount of people who were using AngularJS. And, you know, the vast majority of these people have, have come along with us to Angular, and that's awesome. I think the thing that was most surprising to me was we're seeing a huge uptake from developers coming from the back end. So it's not even that we're competing with other frameworks today, it's that we have a whole new market of people who are doing, you know, ASP.NET are coming from languages like Java and C and C Sharp where they have things like types and they have things like dependency injection. And these people become very, very comfortable in Angular very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So with TypeScript, we're seeing a big uptake on a whole new market that we hadn't seen. And to me, that was something that I had no idea what was going to happen. And it's been really cool to see. Well, and with uh, the approach that uh, Angular team is taking with the, the tooling, it, I think is going to go a long way to that because many of, the, many of those people on the back end, they're come to expect certain, certain kind of luxuries of uh, being able to use a full full featured IDE you know with uh, uh, com with auto completion and that, ex that, that I think know. that expectation is exactly the thing yeah. right like the yeah. people people in other languages expect these things today and I think that for me I, I would like to see you know that the JavaScript community begins to expect these things you shouldn't have to use them right but I think we should have these tools available to use when you get into to large applications one of the things that was um, interesting uh, as a recent change is the change of the versioning system. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit as to like what, what was the decision process that kind of led up to, sure. to you know going with this versioning system? So in uh, in Angular JS, we we sort of did our own thing. Um, we didn't really follow Semver. So in Angular, we had you know version one, and then really the big breaking changes were on the the minor versions. So we went from 1.1 to 1.2, and they typically had pretty major breaking changes on them. Um, that worked for us because we kind of started internally at Google and you know, we were kind of down that road uh, before we got there. But we heard a lot of complaints about it. Um, obviously, as we moved closer to doing things on NPM, uh, you know, it became more and more important to, to fall in line with how Semver worked. So that was the thing that, that right before we released, we wanted to make sure that we, we thought we could stick to that model. Of, of, you know, if we're going to say we're going to do Semver, we need to do it properly. We need to make sure that we're not breaking people. So uh, well, we, we had a lot of discussions on the team about it, about how we wanted to handle this. Um, in the end, we decided that we wanted to do semantic versioning. Um, it's funny because like, the, the larger ecosystem, I think, has always done Semver. Um, the Angular community, though, it's never, never been a thing they've really thought about. So we had quite a bit of pushback initially on this idea of, of semantic versioning. You know, we, we hadn't considered Semver when, before we released it, so we, in, ourselves had called everything Angular 2 forever, right? Like every, we have internal Google projects that the, the folder names are Angular 2, right? So it got to the point where you know, we knew we wanted to, to be able to make changes. And I think the point of the versioning system is we know that the web is going to change, right? We know that there's going to be new APIs. There's always going to be a better mousetrap on the web. And rather than sort of saying, well, change is bad and we can't deal with it, we wanted to make sure that we could strike a balance between evolving Angular at a pace that you know, kept you up to the latest and greatest, and also allowed you to build and be sure you know, that you're, we're not going to break you every six months. We're not going to, you know, you guys have applications to ship, and we understand that. So a lot of debate, and really it became a thing of, we feel like the six month uh, major release cycle, it's very similar to what, to what other frameworks do. We sort of base the idea on uh, like the way that iOS or Android do releases, right? They're scheduled, they're timed, you know what's coming. It allows us to plan, and I think now that we've gotten to Angular 4.0, and we, we sort of, I feel like we've, we've delivered on this commitment we made, right? We said to everybody, we're going to do a major version, we're going to make some changes, we don't want to break you. Um, and I think with version 4.0, we've more or less hit that goal. That's very validating for us, because we know, OK, this thing, this crazy idea we had, we're going to rewrite everything out from under you. We made it work. And that gives us the confidence now to do all kinds of interesting things going forward. Um, and so that, that's really why we went down this versioning path, because we knew that we didn't want to get into a situation where five years from today, Angular became something that had to be thrown out for the next version of Angular, right? We, we want to be sure that we are always going to be uh, you know, on the latest and greatest to what the web has to offer so that people can build really, really good apps. And what do you think uh, people can expect if uh, you know, there's a feature that they're relying on that, that is going to be changed or removed? Uh, what, what do you think um, 
what, what will happen uh, in that situation? I think that we implemented when we started this is we have started uh, very much doing a design doc process. Um, and it's a little bit modeled on Ember's RFC processes, right? We, we think that that's a really cool idea. And what we hope is that through this process, we, we're going to be upfront about the things that we do intend to break. And what we hope is that getting the community feedback there lets us know, actually, I depend on this thing, right? And we've already had a couple of those in, in the two to four shifts where people came to us in the early RCs and said, hey, I depend on this thing. I really need it. Uh, you know, can we do something else about this? And we said, absolutely. You know, we can push that back a version. That's not a problem. I guess that's why I exist as a developer advocate, right? So if you're using Angular and you see that we're, you know, we intend to deprecate something, then reach out to me and say, hey, you know, this doesn't work for us. And, and we will absolutely see, like, you know, can we give you a better replacement? Can we give you a little bit longer to deprecate? You know, we will always work with you on, on trying to make those things work for you. At the end of the day, you know, we do have to push things forward, but you know, we have thousands of thousands of thousands of line at Google, code at Google that we have to support the same way, right? So we want to make sure that that's easy for everybody. That's, uh, I would say, one thing that's really interesting about Angular is that you do have, uh, before you ship a version, you have the ability to run this version against a bunch of code that you have written, right? Yeah. So you can actually see what's going to happen potentially, right? It's a really we have, interesting situation. We have like the greatest QA department in the world, for sure. It gives us a lot of confidence that we can say, yeah, we've run this against like 4,000 target tests, right? And then we can ship it out to the world and be pretty confident that, that things are working OK. That doesn't always happen, you know, that people outside Google are doing things often slightly differently than mm. things inside Google, which is why we have an RC process. But yeah, having that, that initial layer of validation is, is hugely, hugely helpful for us, for sure. One thing that you mentioned, uh, the Ember RFC process, mm. uh, one thing that um, the Ember RFC process does as well is allow people to propose a change, yep. right? Um, do you see uh, that kind of feedback uh, being um, considered in uh, the uh, Yeah, the so uh, I spoke to, uh, on stage this morning about Platform Server, and actually we had uh, a couple of community contributors uh, submit proposals to talk about uh, how we actually handle this in Angular CLI. So we don't actually have an official process for contributors to do so yet, mm -hmm. but we have already run a couple of contributors through this process. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they came up with ideas that we've never even considered, right? Cases that we've never even thought about. So absolutely, we want to have those things. And again, if that's something that, that a developer wants to do, he or she is absolutely welcome to reach out to me, mm -hmm. um, and we will get them on board that process. Um, I expect sort of closer to Angular 5 in the next six months or so, we'll formalize that process and, and you know, give a giveaway for developers to do it kind of automatically if they wish. Um, but at the moment, it's very new to us as well. Like the Angular team is, is certainly not used to working under these constraints of design documents. Um, it's good. I think that you know my perspective is it's a really good thing. It's it feels a bit like we're growing up sometimes. Um, you know, that we have to have the rules and there are processes and things. Um, but they've already caught for us a lot of interesting things that we hadn't really considered. Um, and it's a great place for our engineering team, who are very very great engineers, and our developer relations team, me and Stephen, who are. Uh, we're, we have a different perspective on a lot of things. We, we, we try to understand better how developers are thinking about Angular. Yeah. So it gives us a space to push back and say, this isn't good enough. This isn't going to be understandable to developers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, we expect our, our developers to be able to do the same thing to us and say, this isn't good enough. This is too complicated. Mm -hmm. you know, or this is a feature that's missing that you hadn't considered. So we'd absolutely like to make that available for, for developers. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have, we have the greatest community in the world right now. Like we're at this amazing conference, and I've had people already come up to me and say, "Hey, I have this great idea for this feature, and we're going to run all of these people through this process." Um, sometimes that process means that actually maybe it doesn't come into Angular Core, and maybe that's something that's better lift outside of the Angular Core, and maybe it goes into something like NGRX or a new org, um, and that's absolutely fine as well. And we want to support those cases as well. Can you describe uh, kind of how? the Angular team thinks about the role of the community uh, in this process, or in general? Sure. So I think that we see them as, I see them truly as my customers, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting being a framework author and, and thinking about how you're, thinking about what your customers are, right? Um, our customers are, are Angular developers, but then like our team is also Angular developers, right? I, I kind of think it like we have this, we have layers. So we have our Angular core team, right? We have this, this first layer of QA we get from inside of Google. And then we have this community of amazing, for example, our, our Google developer experts. We have a number of Angular Google developer experts. And they're, again, like this, this next layer out that give us validation and testing and whatever. And so we have this really nice layered ecosystem where you know, the core team kind of sets the agenda. And then as we move out different layers of the stack, 
We have people who are doing blogs, who are translating these ideas, who are building demo applications, who are, who are translating sometimes the, the crazy and not understandable things we say when we're writing code into concepts that users can understand. I don't think that Angular would be anywhere near where it is today with our community being so engaged. Um, our community, you know, they're writing our documentation, they're doing huge amounts of stuff for us that A, the Angular team doesn't have time for, uh, and B, in a lot of cases, we don't have the, the right mental attitude. We don't have the right um, insight onto the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So the community for us is, is, they are the biggest part of Angular, I think, for us. Um, and, and really, like, they are, to me, they're just a larger part of our extended team, right? And that's why I love coming to this conference so much, because it's like, it's like coming to a high school reunion where you actually like everybody, right? Like that's that's kind of how I feel about NGCon. So yeah, I, I definitely see the community is is wonderful, and I think that one of the things that was that oppressed me the most when I joined the community a few years ago is that it's very clear, and it's become more clear to me as I've now moved closer and closer, and now I'm on the core team that that attitude is really set at the top from the Angular team. So the Angular team, it's our team policy that you know everybody should feel welcome. Uh, we do not, absolutely do not try and compete with, you know, our, our teams who are building similar things. Um, we don't want to get into fights. We think we're all solving the same sets of problems, right? And if we set that attitude at the top, that this is how we behave and this is how, you know, we want our community to work, we've seen that it trickles down to the entire community. And our community, I think, uh, has really gotten on board with this idea that, you know, like everybody can come build with us. And, Brad shirt on stage today says, you know, you can come sit with us. And that's that's really what it's about for us, right? You know, you might be writing apps. We have people in our community who don't write apps. They write docs, they do blogs, right? And they are equally as valuable to us. So if you could ask the community to do something, like if there was some kind of call to action that you would like the community to consider, um, what would that be? I talked this morning uh, in my talk about platform server, which is this new server running architecture that we have. Um, it's very simple, it's a very core thing, and I think that part of what I wanted to inspire in the talk was there are a number of different things you can do here, right? There are, the possibilities are sort of unlimited. Um, but the reality is that the Angular team is likely not going to build many of these things because, again, we have different use cases, we have different requirements. So the thing that I would really like to see more than anything else in the community, and we already see this happening, is I would like to see the 10 people who want to build, or you know, the 10,000 people who want to build a CMS get together, form an organization, you know, begin to work together in teams for these things. Because you ha we have this great community, and I, I do feel sometimes like they are working independently of each other. Mm -hmm. right? And so I started this NGRX organization, and the point of NGRX was to get the people who were thinking about reactive programming in Angular all focused on the same thing, all working under the same umbrella. And I think that that is the best way for our community to scale up going forward, right? Um, Form groups, form tribes, do the thing that you're doing, and you know, leverage all these incredibly smart people in our community, and it gets better for everybody, right? I think that five, you know, a year from now in Angular 5 or Angular 6, I'd like to see you know, a CMS project, I'd like to see an AMP project, but not run by us, run by our community with support from us. You know, if you need something, as you said, open up an RFC, talk to us, but we'd like to enable people to build, if you like, the next layer of their stack on top of Angular. And do you have any suggestions for people how they might about doing that, or like any kind of uh, hints, uh, approaches that they could consider? Well, so the the thing that we find a lot is that people are are quite intimidated to start a new project, right? Like you got to start a GitHub repo and all of these things. And I think that again, this is like Ember's RFC process is a nice model here, right? Where if you have an idea, I think that the first thing to do is just write it down, right? Write down your idea, explain or try to explain at least what you see the vision of this as, right? Because you know that in your heart already, that's why you have this idea, right? And you're the best person to, to put forward that, that concept. So if you can write it down and at least make it in a way that people can share it and we can begin to discuss it, right? Getting it out of your head is the first step. And then we have this great community who will help you nurture that, you know, help you grow this thing. But I think that the first idea has gotta be get it out of your head. Don't worry about writing code, don't worry about solving all the problems. Just get the idea out of your head, and you know you can reach out to me or Steven or any of our amazing Angular GDEs, and every single one of them would be absolutely happy to spend two hours on the phone with you sitting and talking through your idea. That is that is the greatest thing about our community, is that they're really good at nurturing these ideas that, that new people have. And I was the same, NGRX, my project, you know, I'd never done open source before. Um, and I wrote this thing over a weekend, and now it's probably one of the most sort of popular uh, projects in the Angular ecosystem. And that's just because 
I had a huge amount of people who supported me and gave me good ideas on this and gave me feedback and allowed me to evolve this thing to something that worked for everybody. It's, on, it, it's interesting that uh, you have the Google developer experts who, um, it sounds like they, uh, they can actually be um, kind of go-to people for hel helping navigate kind of uh, bringing an idea to the greater Absolutely. Angular community, right? That's, that is, and that's a role that I don't think we had, we had considered for them originally. Um, they do a lot of advocacy, a lot of public speaking, things like that. But I think that that's a really good point. I think that they are, they would be the best place to start first contact with, I have this idea, because our GDEs are so wide ranging in so many different fields. You know, we have GDEs who do Internet of Things devices. There's been really cool stuff at this conference with IoT and, and various ideas. And they're all coming from our GDEs. So they are really great first points of contact. You know, if you want to bounce an idea off them, reach out to the core team or whatever, but you know, these GDEs are everywhere. There's a whole bunch of them, and they're always happy to chat all the time. So that's a great, great first place to start. What, fe what upcoming features of Angular are you most excited about? The thing that I'm most excited about is, uh, so Angular, we've really teamed up with the RxJS community. So Angular and RxJS are, are, they just work together very, very well. Um, but the interesting thing about the RxJS observable reactive part of Angular is that that didn't really come into to the picture until much later in the design process. Um, that was an outside influence, Victor Savkin and people like this sort of said, hey, there's this new reactive idea that we're, that we're liking. And so what's happened is that in Angular 4, um, really like there's a bunch of really good reactive stuff, but the internals of it are very much, um, they're very much sort of based on the older ways of doing things. They're kind of, we've got reactive that sits on top of imperative, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Part of our design goals for five is to really, uh, really make this reactive story first class. Mm -hmm. um, part of that means, for example, we want to align with Jafar Hussein's proposal for the observable specification, so that we can get observables from the DOM and be able to do, you know, complex things like drag and drop and really interactive things that are very difficult to do today without things like RxJS. Um, so for me, it's really about taking this reactive story and making it really first class. I think that in general, the Angular team has has always presented the sort of imperative ng model way of doing things with the and the the new reactive way of doing things as as sort of equal and you know you should choose whichever you wish i think that we found that the vast majority of the community has embraced the reactive way of doing things we've already seen some pretty major benefits in performance and you know the ability to understand and reason and debug your applications so i think that our team policy is going to become that we're going to start recommending this reactive way of doing things which is something that we we generally don't do we sort of say here's all the things you can do Choose. But we really want to make say we want to be able to say we think this is the right way to do things. This is the way things are happening inside of Google, and that means that we get to build some stuff that I've been wanting for a very long time in the core of Angular. Um, and so I'm most excited that this reactive story is going to become just amazing over the next six months. And I think it's amazing already, but it's going to open up a huge possibility of apps that I think people haven't even thought about yet. It's very exciting. Thank you very much, Rob. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. Great. Hey there. Are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? Then join this dot instructor, Ben Lesh, to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. Available online and in person, go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to book your spot today.